to the podium, Mr. Jarek Robbins. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of JRC TV. We have a special guest joining us, Mr. Dan Martell, um, to, to give a brief intro of some interesting things about this gentleman, and then we'll ask him to share some useful information along his journey. Um, he, he grew up with a pretty interesting start to life, a little bit of a rough road, um, whether you know drugs, jail, just interesting decisions that that put him in a tight position and and led to something that was kind of his aha moment and his turnaround, which was, if I'm correct, learning the code, um, and 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 that just opened up a path where it's like, hey, here's a useful asset, and then he took that asset and he he really did a hell of a lot with it. I mean, he's he's built three different companies, he sold them, he he's built one of the my favorite companies that I use for for speaking to different people when they have to ask me a hot burning question. Um, which is called Clarity.fm. That one sold, or do you still have that one? No, that one got acquired in 2014. Nice. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, yeah. I'm still involved as an advisor, though, just because like the community is important to me. Absolutely. It's also an awesome tool. I, I like what you said about when you first started it. It was just a way to handle the influx of all the people saying, hey, can I pick your brain? And then you tweeted it out to the world, and lo and behold, it turned into something pretty awesome and just went. Just a bit. Yeah. That's rad. Very cool. Um, so today we're going to talk to, to to Dan. Based on his experience and track record, we want to dig in and, and learn a bit about entrepreneurship, if that's okay. And and the, the audience here, they're, they're people at all different stages. Some of them are just getting started. So this will be useful for some of those startup tips of, of what to do when you got the burning idea and think it's going to take you know ten bazillion dollars to get it off the ground and, and how do you get over that? Uh, some of them are, are are really well off and they're crushing it, um, but but they probably need some tips of, of scaling, some insight and strategy of like what the heck do you do when your office goes from you and a buddy to you and you know forty five or thirty or ten or twenty people and and you know. What is there a structure? Is there some system to this madness? And why do I have to tell this dude seven different times this week what we're doing and, and why hasn't he bought into the mission yet? <laughs> that kind of stuff. It happens, and I know you've dealt with it. Um, and, and, and then some of them are, are further along, and, and this will be an interesting thing. I think we can pitch and catch a little when we catch people who they've done all this, but for some reason things are starting to gradually slow down, and they see it and they know it. And it's kind of on the other side of entrepreneurship, which is when things start to decrease and it's like, hey, wait a minute, we had the best, the brightest, the coolest, the most amazing idea ever. How the heck are we here? And why are things falling apart? And why isn't it booming like it used to? And we'll see if we can give them some ideas on how to regenerate and bring it back to life. Um, but to get started, first off, thank you for joining us. Super pumped to be here, Jared. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course, fan of your YouTube channel. Um, I forgot the, the it's YouTube slash, is it your name, Dan Martell? It's actually got the V. So my dad's Victor, so that's where that comes from. So Dan V. Martell, it's the only one where I, I, I don't know what happened. I think somebody else registered it and I wasn't paying attention. I mean, I'm, I'm new to YouTube. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, two years this July. Nice. Um, so, um, yeah, somebody got it while I was busy tweeting or something. It's awesome, though. Lots of great videos, Thanks. all kinds of great insights. Um, and, and so if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, make sure to go to his YouTube channel and click subscribe because uh, you're awesome. going to want to tune in for some awesome videos coming through on, on entrepreneurship and all the stuff we're going to chat about today. So if you like this, definitely go subscribe there because you want to get more of it. Um, and, and, and so in getting started, you, you've had this journey. I'd love to know what were some of your biggest wins along the way your favorite wins and also maybe a couple of your your hardest fails along the way yeah i mean so my, my approach to building companies is pretty straightforward it's it's like i learned how to code it literally became my new addiction i, I was i had a drug addiction problem when i was I was a teenager and you know at 17 learned to code and that, that was where i spent all my time and energy and all i did was you know, and I don't know if this is entrepreneurship, but like I just built stuff for myself. Like everything I ever built to this day, there are problems that I have first, I wanna see resolved, and I'm actually okay if I build something and I'm the only person using it. Like that's actually like an okay thing that, you know, I remember when I was uh, 17, the first thing I built that 
I charge people for kind of was a CD burning app. So they would install an app on their computer. It would synchronize through FTP to get all the MP3s I downloaded off Napster. They could build their playlist for their girlfriend or their friend, whatever they were for themselves. And then it would send me a request that I could then put a CD in the CD burner and it would burn it so that they weren't on my computer. Like, I don't know if you had a CD burner growing up, but if you're the only person on the block, everybody's on your computer sitting there making their mix CDs. Yep. And I'm just like, get off my computer. So that was the first thing I built, Visual <laughs> Basic. And uh, that clearly was probably super illegal, so I wasn't going to commercialize it. But um, yeah, I just kept building tools. So I would just say whoever, you know, regardless of where they're at, like just build stuff for themselves. That's That's been my recipe. I think that um, it allows you to connect. So like every company from, like you said, the call, Originally, it was a call app for Clarity to Flowtown was a social media marketing platform for my brother's home building company. Mm -hmm. um, Sphere Technologies was a way for me to hire incredible talent because I wanted to work with the Navy SEALs of software. And um, yeah, and then those those were like the highlights. I mean, spending time with Richard Branson as a byproduct of building Clarity was cool. Having Mark Cuban invest in, in, in my company. Like all these things, like I, I grew up in a really small town in Eastern Canada. And to this day, I'm still absolutely grateful and humble. Like it, it blows my mind that I've lived some of the things I've lived. Cause as you mentioned, like I didn't, there's like coming from not a lot and then literally being in a fucking hole, like yep. down there. And, um, I, I will never pretend like it's normal cause it's not. And I know that and I honor it and I try to, you know, share as much as that possibility and hope as I can. It's why I do my YouTube videos. It's why I speak to a lot of kids. Um, it's why we're on this podcast. Like if there's an opportunity for me to inspire somebody else that's struggling and, and having troubles. Um, but the truth is, is the road is going to be paved with a whole lot more of that. If you want greatness, if you want to go for it, yeah. you know, my, my whole thing is become the person who can deal, like deal with, like, don't, don't wish that those problems weren't real. Like, like, yeah. Like wish that you were the kind of person that could deal with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that that was in my life, that shifted when I was like 26 that allowed me to actually build companies. Because I failed the first two. I built five companies. Like there's kind of like projects, you know what I mean? Like yeah. things you buy domains for. That's like in the 30 to 40 number of things that I've built that were just like things for me. But companies was like five. And the first two for seven years um, failed. And my dad begged me to get a normal job. And I just is like, I just, I just feel like there's something there. And if I stop now, then I fa see like this is like, if I stopped at that point, then I failed the first two. Right. If I don't stop, then those were learning to get to the thing. Yep. And I guess it was just this like belief from somewhere is that it may not be the next one, but it could be the one after that. And I'm okay because I felt like I'm getting a little bit better at each one. I like that. I, I, I like the piece you said also, which is the the concept of you're, you're building it for you because it solves a real freaking problem that you're annoyed with. And if all the only person that ever uses it, you, and it solves your problem, awesome. The problem's freaking solved. Next, move on. Let's go to the next problem. Let's keep doing something, which is a great place to start from. And, and so for people in that startup position, people who are looking at that being like, hey, it's a problem I hate. I freaking solved it for myself. Um, but how the heck do I let the world know about it? I mean, this is the, you know, the way I think about it is no matter what problem you have. So let's assume other people had it. I mean, mm -hmm. so what's near with, 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 uh, with every company is I know the other projects I was working on at that time. So mm -hmm. one of the other projects when I started clarity was a thing called photo vino. You know, I was in Chile with a bunch of entrepreneurs speaking at an event we were talking about this wine. One of them said, man, can somebody take a picture and email it to me? And I was like, well, what are you going to do with the photo? Because you probably have a photo, like a like your album full of photos of wine. He goes, well, I would love to order some wine. Like, I want this wine. And I said, well, why, why isn't there an app that lets you take a photo and it just orders two bottles right away? Like, literally, that's all the app did. And the whole table went off. Like, I would use that, and this is great. And I just pulled up my phone. I emailed my buddy Howard, and I said, Howard, set up the Gmail account, photovino at gmail.com. You'll get emails from people with photos. If you don't have them in the spreadsheet, ask them for their address and their credit card info. 
save it. And as they send photos, like Howard was a startup guy between things. It was asking me like what he should work on next. And I was like, just do this. Mm -hmm. And then like 10 minutes later, I said to everybody, Howard said, done. And I go email this email, the photo of wine and it, you'll get two bottles shipped to your house in, in the next three days. That was the beginning. Like that was, you know, and it was, so how did we get it out? I mean, I think originally like people just kept talking about it. We had a few friends there that were restaurant tours. Um, then the next level is like we hired a dev company for like eight grand to build the prototype, like a mobile app, photovino.com, like installed, you know, iOS app. Um, super simple. It really didn't do a whole lot more. I mean, there was still this like, you know, uh, Howard became, um, what did he call himself? Uh, what's a wine person? What are they called? The, uh, the sommelier? Yeah. Yeah, he was a sommelier or whatever on the back end, and he had like this whole character he would play out in the email. And we said, look, someday we're going to automate these emails, but keep writing them because it'll give us the the Templates. process. Yep. And the truth was, is when it came down to like Clarity or Photovino, I just I was connected to Clarity in a bigger way, and you know, kind of like I'm going to let somebody else have that. I'm going to do this. Um, get so you need to feel like there's other people are going to want this, and you're connected to it. Right, because I think there, that for most entrepreneurs are creative. There's a hundred ideas we could work on, and that's usually the death by a thousand paper cuts is trying to do too many. Um, getting that product in front of the right customers. My favorite way is to find the community that's already talking about it. Hmm. Right. So, if it's a productivity app, there's definitely online communities for productivity. If it's a, a small business automation thing, there's communities for that. And like, just start participating. Right. Hmm. I remember one of my buddies. Um, he started building a SaaS app and all he did was started answering, so SaaS stands for software as a service, he just started answering every question on Quora that was tagged SaaS. And like, he just added so much value to the questions that people were like, who is this guy? And they'd click his profile, click his link to his product and go like, oh, this helps people like me because it was for SaaS founders. Mm -hmm. So we live in a cool world. I mean, 2017, if you're, whenever you're watching this, like there's no lack of online connection and community i mean you can go to meetup.com and do in-person type stuff and there's like you know from mommy groups to dog owners to whatever your target niche is and um and the online stuff so i think it's step one is just participate in those communities and find those early adopters because that that is something jerry we can talk about but like the the reason software fails is because people validate with folks that are late adopters late majority or mm. laggards right mm. they're not early adopters and and that's what's that's why San Francisco is so special because they they value the concept of an idea so much that they're not willing to kill it right away, right? right? But you you have an innovative idea in a small town in Nebraska, every person you share that with is going to go, "Damn, it's dumb," you know, like kill that. Yeah. Whereas in San Francisco, people go, "That's interesting," yeah. you know. Pinterest is interesting. Twitter is interesting. Like, on on the surface, most people would think that's dumb. Why would anybody want to do this stuff? But then. You just got to like kind of slowly develop it and, and, and unpack it to the point where there's this this golden nugget at the center of it, but you can't be too quick to just dismiss it. Absolutely. I, I think the other thing that happens is those people in Nebraska do have a great idea and then their brain hijacks them and goes, but how the heck are you ever going to do any of this? And, and they look over at San Francisco and they're like, what? I mean, I can't even afford a train ticket to San Francisco, much less a night in a hotel or something stupid. Like stuff's expensive there. How in the world am I going to get someone to pick up my idea? How in the world? And if I, if I put it online, someone will just steal it and make it themselves. Oh, my God. Yeah. All, all that. I mean, so the, the network, we again, we live in a world where you can connect with anybody online, yep. right? So you can just search founders, San Francisco. You can go on angel list and make a list of all the companies that are like yours in your space and email that their email. It's like all of our emails. It's first name at company.com. And so you can at least get a message to them. Yep. And if you can slowly get them involved in your world, then that's how the network starts. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it doesn't cost anything to go to San Francisco. If you got to stay there for the night, but you made a friend, you can sleep on their couch, right? And there's actually like, there's like communities of people that know that and like open their couches to those kind of like couch surfing. And yep. I remember uh, Travis Kalanick, most, this is a fun story. So he was, you know, founder, CEO of Uber. He was one of my first investors in Flowtown. The reason I met Travis was because another friend of mine, Steve, there was an event called TechCrunch 50 going on. Travis was a nobody. He sold his company to Akamai called Red Swoosh. 
But on Twitter, he had like maybe 1,200 followers. And he just tweeted out, hey, if anybody's looking for a place to crash during TechCrunch 50, hit me up. I got some spots on my jam pad. And Steve responded, stayed at Travis, learned who he was. And when I was going to raise my round for Flowtown, he saw that and emailed me and said, hey, do you want me to introduce this guy named Travis? And I was like, of course, I'm looking to meet investors. And that's how I met him. So Travis opened up his house for some stranger to sleep on the couch knowing that people need a place to support their dreams. I mean, that's, that's possible. So I don't care. Like People in Nebraska are saying that, but I can give you four or five other examples of the opposite. Which is awesome because the the reality is over there, people are very, very open and also they're hungry. They're willing to sleep on couches. They're willing to, you know, we just went there for a week. Super hungry. We just went there for a week to film a, a new course with Udemy based on um, performance for entrepreneurs. And and we stood at a friend's apartment the whole week. She was like, hey, I'm out of town. Why don't you just stay at my place? I was like, cool. And, and, and so that- uh, yeah that concept of it's very open. People are very welcoming. People are very quick to share. Um, we were, I, I like using Uber pool there only because it's a little bit more fun. You get to meet people. Um, so, so literally we picked up a girl from work at Google and I was like, Oh, you work at Google? And she looked at me, she's like, yeah. I was like, what do you do? And, and, and she's like, are you from here? I was like, no. She's like, well, everyone works at Google. I started laughing. I was like, okay, fair enough. And by the end of the ride, we were friends, connected on Facebook. She's a designer for their you know, iOS and, and Android app stuff. And I was like, wow, cool. And then earlier today, I was talking to a client. He was like, hey, do you know anyone who designs and codes like apps? Because I really need help on this. So I'm like, dude, I just had an Uber pool with a random girl from Google. <laughs> like, not sure if she could help, but I'll connect you. That, that it's the, I, I call it the assisted living for the millennials. Like San Francisco is a very unique place, right? Like, I mean, you know, but that's what people understand is that like everybody remembers when they started. And I mean, Airbnb, airbedandbreakfast.com. That's what it used to be called. So like I, I was fortunate to meet Joe and Brian early days. And like that idea wouldn't have worked anywhere else. Yeah. Like it, it, it almost required that kind of environment to even have the fertile soil. Like it would have been kibosh in any other city because it's just so silly. But yet they were able to continue to develop it and serve their customers and continue to iterate until a point where it's like, okay, we've got something there. Yep. And um, I just think that for every excuse somebody will give us, we can point to an example of where that's just not true. Yep. And I, I mean, that's just the world, right? I dig it. So a couple of tips. So if those are in startups, uh, I, I think if I heard you right, one, it, get involved. <laughs> you, know, you need to be part of the community. Be part of it. Whether it's online, whether it's jumping on a train or a bus and getting to San Francisco and you know couch surfing for a little bit and just communicating with people and talking to them, I recommend using Uber Pool because you'll meet people. Um, don't be the weird one in the car, though, that when someone gets in, you're like, ha ha, you've arrived. Now what? Don't scare anybody. Be real. <laughs> uh, but but if, if you build a community first online, by the time you get there, you'll have an opportunity to really connect with people and be like, hey, you're Dragon Six Two Four. Like, nice to meet you. Give him a hug, <laughs> and 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 you know you'll see things evolve. So so that's for startups. Get involved. I, I know a book you're you're a huge fan of, which is Never Eat Alone. So lots of tips for networking. And, and Keith's book there. He's been on the sh you know been on our, our blog before. Um, big fan of Keith, and, and he's a great connector. So lots of tips in there of how to connect with these people. So use Never Eat Alone. Those tips to to get involved and dive in, and and don't let your limiting beliefs. You know, get in your way. Don't let the story of, oh, not for me. I'm not there yet. I'm not ready. Like, just go and let the conversations take you. Like you said with Airbnb, let the conversations take you where they need to go because you think it's one thing and in the in end, it'll be totally different. But that ability to, to pivot, uh, I know you're, you're I, I believe you're a fan of Lean Startup Concept. Um, oh, Eric, yeah. Eric was one of my advisors for Clarity and he's an old friend. So yeah, Lean Startup had a huge impact in my life. Awesome. So the ability to know when to pivot and when to stay the course is important. Uh, you know, using Seth Godin's dip concept, of <laughs> know the dip, know when to ride it through and know when to go, eh, I'm done next and move on. Um, but, but also, like you said, the ones that you're most passionate about, the ones that you're really connected to make all the difference. Cause you had two things going at the same time. Um, I, I did have one question though. When you say, you know, one big challenge people face in the startup phase is you have so many options which one do you do? How many options is too many options? So I think there's a difference between like different product options. So like I, I you know, I, I've been coaching kind of a local entrepreneur as a mentor, I guess you'd call it. And 
you know, like he's got an idea every week. And my whole thing is like, that's good. I like the ideation. I like the creativity. But at the same time, you also have to go deep on, on validating. So like maybe like I would say three is a good number for different business or product ideas Mm -hmm. and then move through on each one to the, what I call the, um, the validation step. And, and I, and I have this whole framework I teach called the riskiest assumptions, which is, you know, list them all out, but then rank order them based on riskiest, meaning that if this assumption doesn't work out, then the rest of the business doesn't even work. So like, you know, most people think it's technology, but for, for 90% of the ideas out there, the software can get built. Like there's no risk in, you know, it's not like back in 96 where it's like, I don't even think you could do that. Everything can be built for almost free yeah. in today's world of like Amazon Web Services and Twilio APIs. And, yeah. you know, it's just, that's not the question. It's, does anybody want it? Are they gonna pay at a price, price point that's gonna allow you to build the business? And can you put together a team of people to support you if you don't come from that world? Yep. And, um, yeah, I would just say three for business ideas. And then the other challenge that I work with a lot of my, um, kind of early stage software founders is, uh, you know, I have this technology that solves a problem, but I, what market do I go after? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you know, I, ha- I had a call the other day and they, they have like some kind of like presentation type software. I'll just leave it at that. And, you know, it could be B to B. It could be business to business. It could be pro- prosumer, which is like you know, like like freelancers or speakers. It could be consumer, right? Like Medium or SlideShare, or whatever. And it's like, I, I and I just said I don't really care which one you come to, but choosing to do all three at once is death. Like you're mm-hmm. not going to be interesting or relevant to anybody. And I'm not saying you can't do the other two. I'm just saying wh- it's the bowling pin strategy. Like, what are we going to do one? that if we knock out of the park, it's going to unlock two and three a lot easier. And ideally the first one is the one you're most connected to where you have leverage on your personal network, domain experience, et cetera. And, um, that's the way I think about it, but that's, that's the other part where there's too many things going on that, and I had to go through that clarity. Originally it was a call productivity app and I had to decide, do I want to go deep on that or do I want to make a marketplace? Um, and, I made the decision to go marketplace, but I could have stayed on the productivity app. It would have been a, di- a totally different company. Yep. So you had a strong pivot there and it moved into a great place. Yep. Very cool. So, so that's for the startup people. Um, now let, let's jump over real quick to the, the people who are beyond startups. They have a viable idea. It's working. They've got a team. Um, but it is just a cluster of awesomeness going in all directions they're, they're, they, they don't meet with their team. They're trying to figure out, you know, they told people when they hired them what the vision was and they don't understand why everyone's not still on board and why this guy you have to tell 12 times to do the same damn thing every week and he still messes it up. If they're in this crazy putting out fires, moving in all directions, oh yeah, and they're also trying to try the, the digital uh, nomadic team running system so everyone's yeah. living in different parts of the world on different time zones. Any tips? Uh, I've got a ton. So I built uh, every one of my companies with distributed teams, including my last two that were venture back. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. But notice I said distributed team, not virtual team, yeah. not outsourced team. The, you know, I don't care where people live because I think you can get some real great, um, you know, cost arbitrage, um, you know, different hiring a senior iOS developer in Google versus um, Nebraska. But uh, what I do think is there's some fundamental kind of like like foundational entrepreneurship structure management, right? So I have a process called the LMA uh, process that'll help design the the functional org chart, right? Because I don't believe in traditional org charts because I don't think that's how uh, people think about business. Anyways, it's not how I think about it. I think about like production of getting things done. Yeah. So if you think about like you have the CEO, which is typically the person, and then you have like, what does it take first? Well, it's like code. So product development would be for software. Then it would be marketing, right? Getting people aware of the product. Then it would be sales, taking that awareness and converting it. Then it would be customer success, which is like supporting the new customers. And then it would probably be like something simple like finance, right? Yep. And so you want to structure it in that order. But the key is an LMA stands for lead, manage, and is accountable, okay? Hmm. So LMA, and I got this idea from a, a book. I, I, re, I restructured it, but uh, Gino Wickman wrote a great book on like the EOS, Entrepreneurship Operating System. And he talks about this, but I don't feel like what I did is just kind of like, kind of put it through my lens of like software is you want to lay it out like a, like a production line, right? Cause I studied a lot of like lean startup and six Sigma. And if you think of like manufacturing 
first thing you do to get the most efficiency out of like a manufacturing shop is reorder the stations based on finishing, right? Yeah. So like you wouldn't like have like, you know, assembly being the first thing and then paint and then, you know, whatever. It's like, no, reorder it so that it's on a cart and it goes through. So that's the way I think of like functional uh, departments in your business. Then what you want to do is you want to hire people and it doesn't have to be a formal manager, but you want to make sure that they're LMA, lead, manage, and are accountable for that department. So what happens is most entrepreneurs, they're good at hiring, they're building a business. They're, they're, this, usually, this is usually what stalls them out at a million in revenue per year is they, they, if they were to draw down their team, and this is part-time contractors, or whatever, typically they have about 13 people that are in their life. That they, they essentially it's like CEO and 13 people. And what happens is that it becomes a communication bandwidth uh, overload and really just even a context ramping up overload. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when I talk to somebody, I gotta now get ramped up in their world and what I ask them to do, they're gonna report to me and then I gotta hire them, coach them, give them feedback. And what you wanna do is you wanna push that down. So you could just start with, and I always, when people say, well, who do I hire first? Revenue producing roles, that's simple. So if you think you know that you know, you're a really good developer and you've got that part, so you stay there, then hire somebody that's gonna manage marketing and give them accountability to LMA and, and, and support them. And then if they need to hire a copywriter, a designer, all that stuff, that goes under them and they report to that person. You do not talk to these people. Hmm. Hard for a micromanager because they're gonna wanna you know, see all the copy and see all the ads. It's like, nope. You look, I always say 80% done by somebody else is 100% effing awesome. Like and that, that, and people need to understand that. So that's like, I would say, functionally speaking, if you can do that, no, nobody should have. And this is what Travis from from Uber taught me: is nobody should have any more than seven direct reports, nice. right? So, if you only got seven direct reports, then pretty much if you have eight, you got to figure out where does that eighth person go, or where does somebody that's seven go under, because you can only have seven. And um, so that's on the the functional structure. And then what's neat is. If you're then the CEO of that business and you've got seven direct reports, the way you get free from the business is you hire somebody that becomes COO and you go up. Nice. And that's what Zuckerberg did with Sheryl Sandberg. I mean, everybody knows like Sheryl runs Facebook, right? Mark's CEO, but he's doing like vision projects and buying Instagram and working on a new product. Like he's not sitting in the, the finance meeting discussing budgets. Right. Like that's just like not there. And um, that's how you get free from your business is you hire it. Once you get this thing going and if you get to like three or four million, all of a sudden you have enough meat on the bone to be able to bring that role, that person into that role, comp them accordingly. And then you roll up and you only have one meeting a week with that direct report and you can scale the business out that way. Smart. Um, in regards to consistency and repeatability and scalability, which are like things that I focus on a lot in software. I have a framework called Playbooks, and that's all about how do you build systems that are documented, integrated into the culture, and people leverage to get work done so that it's it's done the same way for every customer based on what you promised them when you sold them whatever you sold them. And you know, some people call them SOPs or uh, you know franchise prototypes, um, but my my framework's simple, and I'll, I can give you a link to download my specific templates. But nice. um, you know, there's yeah, I think Work the System by um, Sam Carpenter is a good book. I think Emith is a primer. It sells you on the idea. They don't give you any help. That's the problem with Emith. Sam Carpenter gives you real tangible things. And then Checklist Manifesto will really dial in your, your process thinking. But all those three books were the genesis of my playbook framework. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. That's super useful. I'm a huge fan of a guy named Keith Cunningham, and, and he's a – big thought process of exactly what you just said. Get to a place where the systems are in, are in place, you have the team set up, and the team has a standard to live by, and each day as now the owner instead of the operator, you're reviewing their standards and making sure everything is green and everyone's hitting their standards and up to par, and if they're not, they're self-updating themselves. They're saying, hey, this was my standard, I didn't hit it, here's how I'm gonna rectify immediately. You see a little red block, tomorrow it's green, you're good to go, everyone's back on track. And worst case scenario, you have to dive in and help them fix the, the one red block instead of every day trying to run after everybody and trying to do 12 meetings with 12 people and all this other jazz. Um, the, smart, super smart. So systems, operate. I mean, total random side thought, 
I've always had this idea just because I, I get to work with a lot of people at this exact stage right here. And, and the biggest thing they're missing is the whole scaling, hiring and firing people and having to repeat the whole e-myth process of teaching everyone all the stuff again and making sure they can do it right. And I've always said it's been very interesting for you know a couple million dollar year business, million dollar year business, a, a small video crew, just young kids in college to say, hey, here's my side business. I'll come follow you around all day in your business. I'll record everything you do. I'll type it up or I'll have my virtual assistant type it up. I'll put it into a little Google Drive for you, hand it back to you, pay us a few thousand bucks, and uh, you'll have all your standard operating procedures done within seven days. I'm like, dude, there's some 20-year-old kid that could make thousands of dollars a week by, by just literally going to people's small businesses and, and doing that for them. <laughs> if I, I had mean, the th- extra th- time, I would be there. <laughs> totally. But I mean, I love that you put it out to the world because that's like one of my beliefs. You know, you talked about like, if I tar- share my idea, people are going to steal it. My thing is, is like, give it away. Like, yeah. the world would be better if there was a kids running around with this idea helping small businesses. Yes. <laughs> We're too busy. Like, entre- we, us as entrepreneurs do not have a lack of opportunity. We see so many ideas. Mm-hmm. And I just find it weird when I meet somebody who's like, oh, I've got this idea I'm not talking about yet. And I'm just like, give it away. Yeah. I, I, cool. really, I really hope some 19-year-old kid watches this and goes, holy shit, that's great. And like, next week emails me like, hey, I made $12,000 last month. Thanks, bro. Like, I'd love that. And, and, and P.S., I probably know five companies I could refer you to immediately, kid, whoever's out there. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but so, okay. So we had this one, and, and due to time, I just want to be respectful of your time. Um, we have the startup phase. We have this middle phase. So we got great tips from right here. Uh, what about, let, let's skip all the way to the other side of the journey. So someone's got a business, and it's aging. It's falling apart. You know, their Blockbuster before Blockbuster turned into the one last store they could tackled on, on Instagram. Um, but th- there's someone who they think they own the market. They think they've got it. And being from a place where you've seen so many things come and go and, and actually kick other people out of the market, you know, the guys with Uber, like they're stomping a little on the taxi cabs. And, taxi. And, yeah. And, and so no, dude, I seen Instagram do it to Kodak. I seen yeah. it, uh, you know, Netflix doing it to HBO. I'm, I mean, I see, I see this disruption. I seen Apple do it to themselves at the, you know, the iPad and their laptop sales. I mean, it's really fascinating. That one hurts um, when you do it to yourself. <laughs> but that's the one you got to do. I mean, so into that question, I think it's, you know, I, re- I always tell, so like there's, there's, there's usually, and I, and I do coach kind of companies trying to go from two to 10 million. Nice. And that sometime is where they're at. And it's either, uh, let's get you out of that business and into something more exciting because Smart. sometimes it's just like they're done. They got into this through happens. I mean, yeah. we all like to think that like every business we started was based on passion, but true this, sometimes we just like out of necessity end up doing something, do it long enough to become good at it. Cause we can't, we give a shit. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we wake up and we're, you know, we didn't plan for success. I have a lot of clients like that where they've got six, $7 million year businesses that they don't really love, but they do good at, and they, they don't know what to do. So I would say it's either an exit, right? And you can exit through uh, selling or bringing that COO in to free up your time, right? And then focus on a new thing and or disrupt yourself. The way you disrupt yourself um, is asking the question, I think I got it from your dad actually. Um, how, how, how do I create more value for my customer than anybody else in the world? Yeah. And that, that question to me is the ultimate question. Cause like I ask myself that almost on a daily basis for my clients, like how do I create more value for my customer than anybody else in the world? Period. If you answer that question, then it's never going to let you sit back and be okay because there's always a next level and it may not be a next level in the current service, but you know, in software world, for example, one of the questions um, that I teach my clients from a product point of view is asking your, your customer, what do you do three minutes before and three minutes after you use our product? Hmm. Right? Like Dropbox probably never asked you that question. Nope. Evernote's probably never asked you that question. You know, Skype definitely has never asked you that question because they're eight, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, Re- reset it four times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, crashed it <laughs> before and after. Like, and, but I think that's the same kind of, the essence is there. It's like, there's more value to be created on both sides of that experience. And I need to, to just look at my customers, their problem, it, it, fall in love with their problem, not your solution. That's the philosophy that I, I always try to remind myself. It's like, you know what? Don't say, well, we're not in that business. It's like, 
maybe you got to be in that business. I was, I was talking to a friend in the sign industry recently and you know, we were talking about like, how can you get into some kind of like, maybe like branding, like helping these, because what happens is one of their segments that's growing is new franchise development. Hmm. And they're just a sign company, but they've got like multinational sign, uh, franchise companies that they do work for. And they've got like these one or two location. And I was like, a lot of them don't know what you know, because you see the big guys, right? right. Like you see Subway, A&W, et cetera, right? But, and you could add a lot of value down here and you're not, thinking of developing that, but you're getting the leads. That's the funny part is like the customers there add more value, expand the relationship yeah. and stay relevant. Cause maybe someday all signs go digital. There's no fit manufacturing. There's no vinyl. There's no, I mean, so, this is funny. And he knows this signs used to be all hand done painting. There's a, there's a documentary wow. on Netflix, dude. It used to be an art. It was an art form of sign. And then all of a sudden, um, LEDs and uh, vinyl printing and like core plast or whatever they call it changed the game and all those those old school handwritten calligraphy guys are done. Wow. So it's almost like he needs he should really consider doing it for himself so that he's relevant with his customers that may decide, you know, if in the future it's all like these holograms and there's no manufacturing and it lasts for 100 years, why would anybody build a custom sign? It's true. But they're still going to need help with with packaging and developing uh, kind of a rollout strategy for the franchisees. That's true. I like that. So for the, those of you who either A, are bored out of your flipping mind because you've been doing whatever for too long and you need something new, disrupt yourself, uh, or bring the C COO in or CFO in and nudge yourself up and let them run it to free you up to go do something else. Those are my favorite stories. I, I met a uh, we w just side story real quick. We'll wrap up. Uh, we walked into this giant house in Vail to, to meet this guy. Uh, a friend of mine was trying to pitch him a marketing deal. So we walked in and we met this guy and I was like, wow. This is one hell of a house. Like, this is amazing. Just amazing on a golf course, just gigantic house. We walked in. I was like, holy mackerel. Like, what does this guy do? So I shook his hand. I'm like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm like, what do you do? And, and he looked at me. He's like, I'm a plumber. I turned around. I'm like, no shit. Plumbers can do this well? <laughs> like, wow. And he's like, well, kind of. I own a plumbing company. I'm like, that makes more sense. And he's like, yeah. yeah. A national plumbing company. But he's from Australia. And he, he started off as a plumber and he did it for 35 years. And I said, what changed? And he said, well, I had kids and I wanted to have more free time to travel the world and, and do something with my kids. So I hired, I decided to have a plumbing company instead of just a plumbing job. I hired a bunch of my friends, put it all together, generated a company, got other people to run it for me. And now I get to be here hanging out with my kids, snowboarding, and uh, the team runs it for me. I was like, look at this guy. And he's like, oh, but it's not my house. I was like, oh. Well, whose house is it? And he's like, well, it's my brother-in-law's. I'm like, well, what does he do? He's like, he's an electrician. I'm like, oh, fuck. And, and so I'm just <laughs> laughing. I'm like, electrician and a plumber in this place? I'm like, okay, yeah. let me guess. He was an electrician for like 30 years? He's like, yeah, he did the same thing I did. We did it at the same time. He was an electrician for 30-something years. I said, hey, look what I'm doing in my plumbing business. You should try it with your electricity business. He said, okay. He did the same thing, hired all his friends, got someone else to run it. Now we're both hanging out snowboarding with our kids, and uh, our companies back in Australia are doing great. I had one question. Are you leaving it to your kids? <laughs> and, he, and he looked at me funny. He's like, I don't think so. I'm like, here's my card. Call me when you're ready. And I said, yeah. I, I don't know how I'll swing the money, but uh, you got a $20 million a year plumbing business that you can be on the other side of earth snowboarding while it's running itself. I'd like yeah. that business. I don't know how to own a company in Australia either, but I will figure it out from now until then. We'll figure it out. <laughs> and, and, and that thought though, like there's so many people that have great ideas that are either in the startup phase like you said, just to recap here, they need to get involved. Get involved online, get a bus ticket to San Francisco or fly yourself, do whatever, but go couch surf, get to know people, get involved, get in the mix and realize you're gonna have to pivot. Uh, number two, they're in that middle phase. They're making you know half a million, million bucks a year. They've got fires constantly putting out. They need to set up that, that spoke you talked about where the maximum spokes, the maximum amount of people they can connect with is seven, you said. So seven, yep. and then after seven, like you need to restructure and Put or underneath somebody, yep. elevate yourself up and get someone else to take over those seven. Um, useful thing I found for that, that, that that might be helpful for people listening, the wealth dynamics personality test. I think it's the one of the best ones out there. Super useful because if you find out who which teammates you need, your teammate can become part of the the outsourcing piece. Not outsourcing, but the, your teammate like your they team. can they can yeah. handle some of I your spokes. So Roger Hamilton created it and I 
I do high end coaching and it's a must for me to work with people at that level because yep. that's the Achilles heel, right? They could hire a great CFO, COO, but if they hire the wrong person for their type, yep. it's a showstopper. They're screwed. So, so that piece, learn how to find that COO, CFO, figure out how to maybe get a coach like, like Dan who could help you best put those people or know where to put the people on your team and, and which people you actually need could be super helpful there from a coaching or a mentoring perspective. Uh, just don't email him, say, can I pick your brain? <laughs> Go to Clarity FM and that, find him on yeah, there. Yeah, those days are over. <laughs> um, and, and then finally, for, for the people who might be aging, either bored out of their freaking mind and or really truly aging, like you're, you, you need to disrupt yourself. And, and not only disrupt yourself, um, but figure out either A, how to upgrade yourself and get someone else to come in and, and who's really excited and passionate about this, who, who run it all day long for you. B, disrupt yourself, figure out how to add more value to your clients than anyone else. Or C, um, the, the, the third part, which is slipping my mind, it was something super valuable. You're going to have to go back and watch the interview. Um, <laughs> don't remember... Oh, you could sell it. And, and yes, you exactly. could, I'm you could sorry, it. you could exit and get into something and else that something. you really do love. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, the truth is, and what, what I, I think you, you've seen a lot of people do, and I'm kind of new to this, you know, as uh, they, they do a profession and then they realize their passion is teaching people do that profession, right? Like yeah. there was somebody that probably helped that plumber guy hmm. that came from like, you know what I mean? And I, I think that that is the cool, like, that's when I see, like, I get to, I get to work with high performing SaaS founders, super niche. There's only about 10,000 SaaS products in North America, but like I now don't have to be the, the operator spending hundred. I mean, I got two little boys. That was a big reason. It's like, I still want to be in the action. I'm just not, I'm not spending hundred hours a week anymore. Like I've done that, been there, exited, good to go, but I'm not going to not be in it. Yeah. And, uh, so by proxy, I get to do that through, through coaching. And I think that that uh, sometimes is a super interesting viable option as well. If they're, they're, you know, happy in life and they want to try something else to give back. And it's, it's super cool. Absolutely. We get a lot of those people that come through our coach training school just because they have real life experience. They've yep. really freaking done it. They're the real deal. And, and they're just like, Hey, is there any framework or structure or system of how to take what I know and actually share it with people? And honestly, it's for them, it's not really about the money. Like the money's fun. No, big freaking deal. money is a filter to get people to take action. That's like, I mean, yeah. I have a premium program mm -hmm. and I'm unapologetic about it because I've given things away for free. And I think we've all learned how that turns out for both <laughs> parties. <laughs> Frustrated and no action. It sucks. I gave away our coach program to four people this year and none of them even used it. And I freaking was ready to punch done. a wall. I'm done. But it's I could a, it, you it, could charge it, someone yeah. five times the price and they'll use it like that. And, yep. and, and the realization of, like you said, money is nothing more than a filter to get them to actually use it. Cause when they pay it, they'll use it. They don't, it'll just sit there and it sucks. Cause you know, good people could do great things with it and they don't, Yeah, you know, the quality you put into it. And it's like, I just gave you this. People are investing in top dollar yeah. and you don't appreciate it. It's crazy. Cause those are usually the people you want to help the most, but they can't help themselves. It's, 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 it is what it is. It is. So if people want to find you, where do they go? If someone happens to so, be in a position where they need you? Yeah, so Dan Martell, 2 Um, You can contact Paige if you want to hit me up to talk. Uh, you can email me at Dan at Dan Martell, 2 Um Stephanie Will, so my assistant, always looks through my emails to make sure that they're, they're on point because I've got crazy ADHD. I can go all over the place. Um, and, uh, I'm on social. So I would love if you could link up my YouTube channel. I put out every Monday, a new video on personal development, um, life and SaaS software business growth. Nice. And, um, and then Facebook, same deal. I do custom videos every Thursday live. I just, I love social. I love the ability to connect with thousands of people, um, with leverage. Very cool. I love it. So like I said in the beginning, if you liked this interview, if you liked this video, Go to YouTube, find Dan's channel. It's Dan V as in victory. Martell, there it yeah. is. Go to Dan V Martell on YouTube. Click subscribe, follow his channel, check out his videos, enjoy them like I have. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us. Everyone else, hope you have an amazing day, evening, afternoon. We will see you all next week for another episode of JRC TV.